Hey everybody, Nicholas Snow here. This is another episode of Notes from Hollywood on Promo Homo TV. And I love when I get to roll out the red carpet for some really cool guests. So, Notes from Hollywood began as a column in 1990. It's had many evolutions and now it's a TV show. And I report on people passionately pursuing professions in the entertainment industry, which on its surface sounds really fascinating and it's often true of my guest. But I find that the filmmakers and the people pursuing lives in entertainment are so much more than that and their goals aren't necessarily having careers in entertainment. Maybe their goals are in fact changing the world or raising consciousness or all of the above. Um, in today's episode, I'm really excited to welcome creator, writer, director, producer Hong Wen and producer actor Diane Chen to the red carpet to discuss their hilarious web series Sideways Smile, the queer Asian American comedy about Alex, a young Brooklynite on a journey of self discover discovery after reluctantly enrolling in a class on sexuality to learn how to have an orgasm. Which is a good time for me to tell you that we're going to talk about some adult topics and I'm showing a movie trailer that has simulated sex and some four letter words. Just so you know, and don't say I didn't warn you, but I want to say this is a sex positive show and you want to stay around for the ride. So getting back to the movie, Alex fakes orgasms because she's never had one. After Dara, who's played by one of my guests today, uh, her eccentric queer roommate pushes her to get to know her pussy better, Alex reluctantly enrolls in a class to get more in touch with her body. Each week, Alex learns something new about sexuality and identity and must reckon with whether she wants to be what society tells her an Asian American woman should be or carve her own path. A hilariously unflinching send-up of the taboos and stereotypes surrounding queer sexuality, the Asian American experience, and more, Sideways Smile confronts and dismantles every tired take in the book, from the fetishization of Asian American women to anti-blackness in the Asian American community, the model minority myth, and the whitewashing of Asian American roles in Hollywood. Sideways Smile announces creator Hong Nguyen as a new voice in episodic comedy inspired by the likes of Broad City, Chewing Gum, and inse inse Insecure, say that three times fast. Quite simply, Sideways Smile is, quote, a style-shifting, consistently entertaining six-episode premiere season, and it's exploring queer sexuality and the Asian American experience in New York City. I'm going to ask my guest if I'm the only like middle-aged white guy that's talked about pussies and orgasms at the top of their interview. That would be fun to know. Um, before I play the movie trailer, I want to just give a shout out to uh, my Patreons. I launched a Patreon account at the beginning of uh, October with this, the fall season of the show, which allows people to support the show for as little as $3 a month. And my first two patrons, I want to give a shout out to them. Global Visionary, that's the $3 category. G. Francis Giles. And at the $12 level, I have Brad Fur, who's publisher of GayDesertGuide.LGBT. This is a live show, so if you're watching live and you have a question or a comment, I can put your comment on the screen like this. This is one of my regular viewers. He's also an actor and an author, and I appreciate his support. So with that, I think it's a great time to watch a movie trailer. But remember, four-letter words and simulated sex, which means you want to call all of your friends right now. Okay, that was nice. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah, baby. I'm, uh, I, I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh, my God, I faked it. Oh. You know what? Take this. It's a class. It's going to take uh, uh, yes, you are. I love the word cunt. I'm a sex worker. I could punch a Nazi every time a white person asked me, where are you originally from? Draw your genitals. Wait, what? Anyone ever notice how there's all these women of color with white men, but not the other way around? Yeah, I see this. 
that's racist. Ah! Isn't it like prostitution? In the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Shaft for balls. I definitely <laughs> tap that. Dude! No! Are med school wrecks really worth all this torture? To me. I'm not supposed to? Yep. People, yep. This guy made us brainwash you. Are you gonna stand on that platform waiting for the train? Or are you gonna get on that O train, take it all the way to Jizz Town? Enjoy. Ooh, thank you. Gotta love bottomless brunch. And I'll be back with Diane and Hong after this. You win me, it's alright. Together, all our lives, a new star is inside. We're falling, it feels right. It's okay to hold me. an educator and filmmaker and the creator, writer, director, and producer of Sideways Smile, an official grantee of the Made in NY Women in Film Fund. She is the founder of Femsex Boston, an organization that runs a community workshop on female sexuality and identity. Her work has screened at Outfest, Newfest, and the Austin Film Festival, and I'm sure she's going to update me on that list. Diane Chen is a New York City-based multidisciplinary filmmaker, theater artist, actor, and co-founder of the Multi-Hyphenate Productions. So Hong is a multi-hyphenate, and Diane's company is Multi-Hyphenate Productions. That works. Their theater work focuses on devised movement explorations and subverting the expected. Their award-winning series, Here We Wait, has been making its international festival circuit, garnering 31 nominations so far, including a win as Best Supporting Actress at Brooklyn Web Fest and a Best Lead Actress Drama nomination at the IAWTV Awards. They are a co-star on HBO's High Maintenance, in all their work, they strive for striking visuals and stylistic movement and framing and to share the stories of the othered and underrepresented with awareness of intersectionality and representation. By the way, my profiles are he, my pronouns are he, him, and his, and that will become relevant in this conversation. Without further de- delay, I want to welcome to the show Hong and Diane. Welcome! It's so great to Hello. see you. Thank you for having us. So excited. So, thank you for being here. Um, uh, just because people want to know, when I started talking to Diane backstage about this, so, Diane, you're currently in Brooklyn? I am. And Hong, where are you right now? Um, I'm in Vermont, also on the East Coast. <laughs> okay. It's, I think it's a bit colder there than it is yes. in Palm Springs right now. <laughs> yes. Just a little bit. So, congratulations on your series. I've watched all, I've watched all episodes, and I want more. <laughs> Great. So do we. Yes. So if anyone... Um, <laughs> yeah, I understand. I understand. Uh, which, which is a good time to ask the question, and uh, I'm going to 
go with you, Hong, for the first question. Um, are you hoping that this becomes a feature? Are you hoping this becomes a full-length narrative uh, sitcom? Uh, what, what's your vision for the work? Yeah, so we are hoping that it becomes a half-hour show, a half-hour scripted comedy, and you know we would love it to be picked up by one of the many networks that are uh, on TV and uh, giving money to creators right now. So that's sort of our dream. Um, yeah, and hopefully we're working towards that. Well, I could definitely see it happening. And uh, I know that there's probably some heartbreak among you that you cannot be with people at the film festivals where this work is being screened by Absolutely. virtual audiences instead of live audiences. Um, did you have public screenings before the pandemic began? Have you been able to screen this work with a live audience? No. No. <laughs> Just the short answer is no. That yeah. sucks. Yeah, it, it does. I mean, I, I made it because I really wanted, I wanted it to be a laugh out loud comedy and I wanted to hear people laughing and you know, <laughs> now I guess we imagine it. <laughs> I, I will say know. the upside is that, you know, internationally people who participate in the festivals who generally wouldn't have the funds to travel to these festivals in the US uh, have been able to watch and have been able to like connect with us on social media and stuff, which has been, I guess, the rewarding part of doing a uh -huh. virtual festival. Uh -huh. Well, the film festivals I've reported about on this show uh, one of the things that the producers of the festival say is that they actually are reaching more people with the online festivals than they would uh, in their sold out screenings, limited at that, and that they're having also good participation in virtual Q&As. Um, have either of you participated in virtual Q&As? Many. And how, many. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they've been great. I mean, it's been really great to be able to talk to, to talk about the show, um, with other creators in the festivals, um, and just, you know, be able to share our process and why we did the things that we did and all the stories on set. Those are always really fun to talk about. <laughs> okay. I want to ask you each of, a. Uh... Uh, each of you a question. I'm going to start with you, Diane. So what's the oddest piece of feedback you've gotten in a q and A? I I would say, uh, I mean, what's funny is my first answer was, are you, do you mean about this show or do you mean, because I've just gotten oh. weird feedback about a lot of things for well, some reason. You could answer this show and any show. If I mean, I, tops I think that people are interested in, um, you know, how we obtained the sheer amount of dildos that we did for this show. <laughs> <laughs> there were a um, lot. <laughs> it's a pretty unique question that I love to field. <laughs> um, <laughs> but other than that, I don't know. I feel like doing a comedy sometimes is like, you know, it's, I feel like it's more vulnerable to be doing a comedy and have people see you doing comedy than doing drama in a weird way. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, I guess that's probably the the weirdest sort of feedback. That and just like you know, ask, uh, because our because our show uh, spans so many genres and tones and whatnot. Um, you know, it's really exciting when people are like, "I totally know what movie you are parody parodying in the second, or like this reminded me of that, or like the meta ness of our third episode." People really like. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about you, Hong? Weirdest? Um, I don't know. I, I think, uh, I don't know if this is weird, but it surprises me because people say that, you know, it's, it's really brave what you're doing or it's, it's, it's like the topics that we are tackling are so brave. And I, I think when I wrote it, I was like, I think this is just going to be hilarious. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> so, uh, so I think that's, that's also, it's really interesting to see how people interpret um, the work that we're doing and it's great like I love that that's like the the thing the adjective that people describe the work it's awesome um, but when I was writing it it was very much like this is hilarious I'm just gonna do it <laughs> um, 
uh, it's interesting that that's your answer because that that segues nicely into the more serious uh, tone I would like to add to our conversation. So, um, as a fellow queer person, I don't know how you identify Hong, but uh, I know that. Uh, do do you want to say how you identify each of you in terms of the LGBTQI plus spectrum? Sure. Um, I identify as queer. Okay. I'm also pretty darn queer. Okay. All right. <laughs> the so, qualifier that I use, pretty darn okay. queer. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, in our in the queer community, but in broader communities, we know how the use of labels can be used to educate others and to fight for power but the flip side of the coin is they're used to put us in boxes and hold us back identities are assigned to us whether we've chosen them or not and sometimes they're true and often they're not and so i celebrate the comedy of your work but uh, when you were writing it, we had a completely different societal and cultural context uh, than when it's screening in terms of mainstream uh, awareness about the atrocities that have been perpetrated against black and brown people. Are you following me so far? Yes. Okay, so. so my thought is it's joyful your your piece of work your art is joyful and it in that it's funny and it talks about the deconstruction of these identities and the uh the acquisition and discovery of our authentic selves but it's done in opposition to the other way that these labels are used and wouldn't it be great to live in a world where none of these labels are required um, so I know I said an awful lot, but I'd, I'd love to know what your initial remarks are to that little state, that monologue, I, I guess. Hong, let's start with you. Oof. Um, I don't, so, I mean, we're talking about episode three, um, and basically I think when I wrote it, yeah, like it, you know, we weren't exactly in the place that we are now. Um, but I always knew that it was a topic that I wanted to tackle because it wasn't something that are, is often talked about. Like anti-blackness in the Asian community is not often talked about and definitely something that I kind of came across way later in you know my life and like my learnings. Um, and specifically, I was reading this book uh, by Ellen Wu, I think. And um, it she ba she wrote her like entire thesis on the deconstruction of the model minority myth and how um, ident Asian identity in the U.S. was formed in conjunct in conjunction and uh, and in contradiction to um, Black people in the U.S., especially during the Civil Rights Movement. So I thought it was just a really interesting way to frame the conversation um, and to sort of relate uh, the two, you know, our two journeys um, and kind of show the history of that. I don't know if that answers okay. your question, but... <laughs> well, we could talk for two days in response yeah. to my question. Um, Diane, what would, you, what would you like to add? Um, you know, I, I think that what... Um, you know, to bring it back to the show, what I think is one of the m most brilliant parts of this show uh, is the aspect of the classroom and specifically how we've filled that classroom with people who are not one dimensional, who experience multiple intersectionalities of marginalized identities and those identities are really nuanced and those identities can have uh, you know, conflict and they can have sort of internalized issues that, you know, I think that we as like millennial people with the age of social media and whatnot, like, I think we're constantly having to sort of butt heads with. Um, and so I think um, for me, like as a present day 
millennial person who is, you know, queer, but also I'm non-binary. Also, I am, you know, non-monogamous. Like all of these identities, I can't, I can't, you know, pick them apart and just identify with one today. And then tomorrow, just talk about how queer, you know, non-binary people are oppressed or like, just talk about how, and it's like, you know, my Asian Americanness is being viewed through a gendered lens different than a white person, a white non-binary person would be viewed through a gendered lens. And um, I just think that that's my favorite thing about this show is that we don't have like, oh, that's the black person in the classroom and that's the Asian person and that's the gay one. And that's the, you know, it's, um, we really get into the nuance of intersectionality. And I think that is because um, this show comes from people who have experienced that and who have lived experiences at crossroads of those identities. Um, well, we're having sort of a full circle moment because one of my viewers who's actually a cherished friend, Alexis Ortega, mm -hmm. they say, ooh, this seems cool. Where can we watch? And the reason it's a full circle moment is because Alexis, uh, my smart speaker is confusing the word uh, oh. and, and wanting to respond to me. So uh, uh, they uh, taught me what intersectionality meant. I had never quite heard it before. And this was uh, several uh, years ago when I was able... Uh, uh, Lex, as uh, he, as she, and she uh, has now used they. So I'm very careful about pronouns. But when you know someone who goes by a certain pronoun identity and then shifts, it takes a little while. But uh, Lex is an amazing person and works with the LGBTQ Community Center of the Desert here in Palm Springs. Um, so where can uh, people see the film? I'm sure. I imagine that's in some film festivals with virtual ticket opportunities, but do you know about uh, any other releases? And I'm going to bring up your graphic while you answer the question. Yeah, so we are in Bush, uh, we're in the Bushwick Film Festival right now. You can watch the whole season for $7. Um, New Fest is also showing it until the 27th. And then Austin Film Festival is starting tomorrow and showing the first three episodes. So message us on Instagram, follow us on Instagram, and um, we can point you in the right direction. Uh, we don't have any wide release plans yet, though. Um, we're kind of waiting to finish the festival circuit for that. I understand uh, completely. So, uh, Hong, tell me a little bit about the work that you that you did in Boston that sort of laid the groundwork for uh, many of what uh, many of the topics that this film touches upon? Yeah, so, um, well, it started actually when I graduated from school and I was living in DC and I actually took a, a version of the class there. This class is pretty grassroots. It started at university um, and it's in a lot of different universities in, this, in, in the US. And then it sort of moved into community groups um, in the US as well. So I took class in DC and when I moved back to Boston, which is where I'm from after, you know, I don't know, you know, it's your recent grad years, you're lost, you don't know what you're doing. Um, I just knew that this class meant so much to me. It meant it like, really changed and altered where I wanted to go and do with what I wanted to do with my career. So I ended up kind of very also grassroots kind of been like, oh, I want to do this thing. And I contacted the people in DC, they hooked me up with their curriculum. Um, I partnered with the Women's Center in Boston and Cambridge. And you know, we just started this like semester long class um and i recruited people we market you know it was very just like at first it was just me kind of trying to pull people in or get people interested and um we had a great response and we kind of started really small and um it it and then it just kind of kept going after i moved some people took over um and it was really you know incredible great experience of building community um and also learning like i you know, I took the class already. I've, I've also facilitated the class, but every time you facilitate, you learn something new and you're kind of challenged. Um, and you kind of have to like, you know, keep learning, keep learning, keep learning, keep learning. Um, and so I think that's been a really helpful, as you said, experience writing this show because I'm 
I'm constantly coming across, as Diane said, sort of the intersectionality of um, these identities and these stories and kind of thinking about how that impacts um, the world and, and how we view it. Uh, I think it's so important to talk about intersectionalities because so many people don't understand that. Um, Diane, one of the things that you referenced was that you can't lead with one of your intersectionalities. It's like you are in, in your own totality, mm -hmm. uh, but other people are going to want to accentuate one one of the one of one or more of them and discount sure. others. Mm -hmm. So I, I was wondering if you would expand upon that a, a, a bit more, but also take us back to how you came to know Hong, because I think there's probably an interesting story there. And then she can respond. Oh man, Hong, we gotta come up with a better story. <laughs> um I don't know. I met Hong through um the I I did uh some some stuff in like the new york comedy scene with uh hong's partner and then i met hong and i i sort of love the way that the script came about which was in a very like sort of casual fashion which is how hong managed to trick me into producing again because <laughs> i've <laughs> i've produced before and i you know i i don't know if you relate to this nicholas but every time i po i produce i say never again never going to do that again. That is stressful. And I don't know why people do it. <laughs> but then, um, but then Hong brought the script to me and was just like, well, why don't we just, you know, read it in my living room with a bunch of friends and just like have a nice night. And then of course I read it and was like, wait a second, this is brilliant. And Hong was like gracious enough to bring me into the fold. So, um, so yeah, I would say pretty organic sort of, um, natural way of going about it i wish we had a crazier diane was, the, diane was the best actor i knew so i was like please <laughs> be in the show and hong how many people in that reading made it into the the, the series oh i think diane did mm -hmm. <laughs> It was, oh. Yeah, it was it wasn't it wasn't like an odd, you know, audition reading. It was like uh, how many friends can I get in my living room to to read some some okay. stuff that I wrote. In fact, you know? I did not read Dara. Yeah, you read for the main character, I read right? Alex. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um Diane, let's go back to my question about the intersectionalities and the uh, challenges yeah. of uh of and I know Hong you could answer the same question, but Diane you had brought it up before, so I'd love to know more of your take on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, this this sort of uh, thesis statement that I've been working on, just, you know, me and my own little brain, is that, uh, you know, I think that I think that the word queer, like since it's been reclaimed, I think that queer can almost all uh, almost be a verb in that, like to queer something or to live like in a queer fashion, I think to me just means to be able to, you know, take a step back and look at what your environment is or what your situation is and just sort of question the status quo and ask like, why is it that since I was a kid, this was told to me, why are these rules, the rules that I need to abide by? And why does it feel like I don't naturally fall into these boxes that have always been presented to me? I think being queer is actually kind of that simple. And I think that, you know, in all the ways that I have, discovered personally that I don't like to fit into the norm of what people are telling me I fit into. I have sort of taken that lens and examined like, you know, all sorts of aspects of my life and my identity and how I fit into this society, like how I, how I date, how I present myself in public versus how I really like to dress in private maybe, or, um, you know, so I think that I think that it was sort of all just like one thing led to another. And the more that I thought about it, the more I was like, yeah, you know what? I've never liked the way that when I was a kid, I kept being forced in dre into dresses. Like I was sneaking shorts into the bottom of my school backpack when I was in like second grade. And why is that? Like no nothing was telling me that to rebel like that, except for the fact that just like in my very soul like I just I knew and none of these boxes never made sense to me so 
So yeah, that's my very long-winded, rambly answer to your question. <laughs> I, I frankly think a lot of people out there uh, benefited from your answer. And I know my friend Lex Ortega, they would uh, love to have coffee or tea with you, I'm sure. Lex, in a Great. recent interview, was talking about how they have really taken ownership of the word queer. Uh, Diane... Um, do you have a different or similar experience of sort of the uh that's hong the oh so i'm sorry hong hong do you have any experience uh that's different or similar to diane's regarding the uh, the boxes of uh, of other people's views of who you are and and your own effort to own your own intersections I mean, our, Diane is so articulate. This is why I have Diane in these interviews. I just like, <laughs> Diane's so much better at saying these things than I, do, than I am. Um, you wrote the show. I, <laughs> I, I know, but I, uh, what, was, what was I going to say? Um, yes. So I think for me, the, what the class made me realize is that there's people always have, there's a story that like, they were fed, as Diane said, right? When you're growing up, you have these stories. And then you realize that there are choices. In, and actually, you only realize that there are choices if someone tells you that, hey, look, look, this is like a lifestyle that I have that's different than what the mainstream is. And so for me, it's more, it's about being able to choose to make that decision yourself rather than just be given it and, and decide to go down this path. And whether you choose to go down the mainstream path or the alternative path, totally i don't no judgment from me it's just that you knew that you had a choice and you were able to choose and that for me is like what the show what you know um i guess yeah what what the show's about uh one of the one of the things i wanted to talk about um one of the the topics that your film takes on are the fetish 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 would you like to say that word, Diane? What is that word? Fetishization. Fetishization. Yes. Yeah. Fetishization. Fetish All right. Fetishization. Fetishization. I'm usually better than this, I promise, um, of uh, Asian women. But I wanted to let you know that I, I lived in Thailand for five and a half years. I ended up being invited there for a film festival. I ended up basing myself there for professional reasons. Uh, it has a very adventurous gay scene and a lot of gay men who go there go there because they fetishize Asian men. Um, I don't count myself among them. I am an equal opportunity lover. Uh, but there have been periods in my life where I was particularly attracted to a, a person of a particular ethnicity. Um, so the question I have for you is do you think that an attraction that leans toward a particular ethnicity is inherently racist or can it exist in the absence of racism what a question diane what are your thoughts my i have a thought which is um i always like to think of it this way right like if you say that you uh, you want to unpack why you you as in the royal you the general you if you want to unpack why it is that you are in uh attracted to a certain ethnicity a certain i don't know uh look or um i would then i would then ask you if you have friends of that ethnicity or if it's just something that you're looking for in your dating life and your sex I would start there because I think, you know, if you're really just looking at it from a, from a sexual perspective or even just a sexual and romantic perspective, I would, I would want to further unpack why that is and why you don't have friends that are also in those communities. That's sort of my first thought. Well, that's an, that's an interesting thought. Anyone you want, anything you want to add, Hong? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a nuanced issue, right? I think it's not... And in that episode, I didn't want it to be so, like, like 
black and white, right? It wasn't that, like <laughs> that episode is hysterical, but it's just <laughs> <Thank> hysterical. <you. laughs> um, I wanted to show that it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like mail order brides and like men who have like yellow feet. It's not just that. It's like I know plenty of amazing, strong women who are with their white partners and the and I think the episode is more about like talking about it, being able to raise aware like consciousness about that phenomenon right. and kind of being able to have that discussion with whoever you're with or or whoever um, and kind of unpacking it because at the end of the day there there is a lot of power dynamics, historical power dynamics, right? Maybe it's not you and your partner because you didn't live through those times, but there is his history that comes into these perceptions and these um, into these perceptions of other other races and and how that intersects with like romance and 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 sex and and desire. And I will say that that perception is then perpetuated by a mainstream media that is mostly yes. gate kept by a singular perspective. One of the things I really appreciated uh, about your series is that I was experiencing people and stories that I don't experience because you created this body of work. And I wanted, to, I found myself wondering, is there a lot more of this out here that I just haven't seen because of my own life experience? Or is your series as unique and different as it seems in the bigger picture? I wish it was the latter. I don't know. <laughs> Diane, what do you think? I mean, I think that's almost like a bittersweet question. Um, because we because we synthesize so much of how we conduct ourselves through what we consume in the media. Um, I think it's a bittersweet question because I, you know, I wish we had seen this earlier. I wish we had seen something like Sideways Smile earlier. Um, it seems like, you know, when shows are touted as revolutionary, those people and those perspectives have always been around. They just haven't been on your TV screen. And we just have to look at who's making the decisions about what we get to see on our TV screens. It's not really anyone's like, uh, you know, it's not like, it's not like any community's fault for not being able to produce the, the art or the whatever, because those communities are out here living their experiences. And um, it's unfortunate that they're not seeing these experiences mirrored or paralleled on, on screen. I know that uh, uh, as a member of the queer community, it was very powerful. I'm a quite a bit older than the two of you, but it was a very powerful for me when I first b began to see queer representations in the media, very powerful. It's only been recently that I've realized how how my life has been so narrowly uh, um, experienced because of systemic racism. Uh, and here I thought I was on the front lines of this LGBTQ civil rights movement. And then I realized, oh, well, there are lots of LGBTQ people that are fighting battles that I have no clue about. So um, I'm kind of having a completely different view of my life and how it could or would have been different with what I know today. So I'm challenging myself to be part of the solution and to look at my own connection to the problem. Um, but the reason I wanted to talk about history was I remember how powerful it was when Margaret Cho was cast in a major network television series. Um, you're probably way too young to have uh, been around when that happened, but you're not, I'm sure, um, oblivious to how historic that was. So you, you, you both must know about that story. Yeah, it got canceled after one. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know all the backstory that was yeah. there. Uh, I, I have since interviewed Margaret on a few occasions. She's quite a wonderful person. Um, I've also I've also met Margaret. She is wonderful. She's yeah. quite a force. Diane, across Margaret Cho in High Maintenance. Yes. Everyone go watch that episode. 
episode? It's a pretty good episode. <laughs> Which one is it, Diane? Uh, season three, six, four, season four. three, episode oh. five or six. I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> um, is there anything either one of you would like to talk about? Uh, well, I just, I, I, I have... I, as you can see, I have no problem coming up with questions of my own, but I did look at some of the talking points that your publicity team prepared, and I love it that your crew was made up of 95% women, femme, non-binary, trans, or people of color. I think it was more than 95, honestly. I don't know where that number came from, but I think if you actually did the math, it ends up being more. It's like 95 to 99%. <laughs> yeah. 95 to 99. And... Yeah. Uh, and the cast is made up mostly of people of color, and diversity isn't a token part of the series. It's just, it's just the world. It's just, we just want it to be the world. You know, we don't, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's period. <laughs> and also the classroom scenes, we really did, um, we really did explore some of the personal perspectives of some of the actors, if the actors were willing to come forward and speak with us about their experiences on like what the topic of the week was in the classroom. That was uh, definitely one of my favorite parts of the, the process. Yeah, and if it you felt watch- felt alive. And if you watch it maybe closely, or I don't know, um, more closely, every, every character in the classroom has a very specific story um, that sort of comes through as you keep watching the, sh- the episodes. So you start to piece together, like, why are they there? Like, what's their mm-hmm. deal? Like. You know, it's not just like they're there to spout some words <laughs> that like some wise words to Alex, right? They're there like, and, and I hope when we get to, if we get to make, when we get to make like a half hour full series that we get to really explore those characters and their motivations and who they are and, and their backstory. Yeah, I like cutting to the to the reaction shots and seeing the characters' opinions on maybe someone else's Mm-hmm. storyline or like alex alex's storyline and uh yeah slowly like piecing those things together well i love the series i congratulate everyone involved uh is there anything that you would like to add that i haven't that we haven't talked about um i don't know did you laugh hope you guys enjoyed it laughed hope you guys enjoyed the really crazy storyline <laughs> Well, a lot of them haven't seen it. They want to see it, and they can go to SidewaysSmileSeries.com. Right. They can find out what film festivals you're in at that link. Uh, yep. And there are many opportunities to get virtual tickets to those films. Um, Lex, who asked at the beginning of the show where they could see it, now knows how to find film festivals, at least for the next few days where it's still happening. Yes, and you can watch from month. your couch, in your PJs, with popcorn that doesn't cost $10. <laughs> if you yeah, want. It, it, exactly, exactly. Well, I want to thank you both for being on the show. I appreciate it. Uh, the movie, the you know, I watched it all back to back, so it felt like a short film. But it is actually a series, and it is available uh, at film festivals. And uh, you can find it at SidewaysSmileSeries.com. And I encourage all of my viewers to look the two of you up on IMDb because you have uh, (laughs) other things happening as well. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. My pleasure too. Have a great night. You too. Thank you. Bye. So those were my lovely guests, and it was wonderful to have the opportunity to talk to them. And once again, be sure to check out uh, Sideways Smile series and uh, keep tuned to Promo Homo TV because we have lots of shows coming up. I'll see you next time. You're with me, it's all right, together, on our lives, a new star is inside.